so it's four in the morning and I can't sleep I've got just the worst toothache you can imagine it feels like oh it bloody kills my jaw is like burning up it's oh it's unbelievable oh, anyway there's only one thing for it because I'm just not going to sleep so some of these ibuprofen and maybe maybe I'll be in some kind of fit state to actually go to work in the morning So, thankfully, the pain's died down a bit now, and I thought it'd be quite good to explore the chemistry of painkillers a little bit, and how it is that they work, what kind of structures they have, and find out a little bit about their history. So, it was Hippocrates who first extracted a powder from the bark of the willow tree, and found that it was active against pain. But obviously in that era there was no real understanding of the chemistry, and why the bark of this tree should be so effective. In the 1820s and 1830s, the chemistry behind this active component in willow bark was discovered, and it was found that salicylic acid was the active ingredient. But it was too irritating to use directly treating humans with salicylic acid. And so chemistry got played with over time, and a derivative of salicylic acid was found, which ultimately became aspirin. Here we're looking at the chemical structure of aspirin, Hopefully you can name the functional groups that are in this compound. And that's your first chemical test, just name the functional groups present in aspirin. It was first synthesized in 1853, but it wasn't really realized that it had pain-killing potential until the late 1800s, when Bayer developed it in 1897 in Germany and finally brought this drug to market in 1899. It works by inhibiting an enzyme called cyclooxygenase, or the COX, enzyme. And what this enzyme does is it converts arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. And prostaglandins play key roles in pain and in fever and in inflammation. So aspirin has an effect in controlling pain and fever and inflammation. So aspirin made buyer a lot of money, so it's not surprising that other companies became interested in developing painkiller medications. And one of them was around significantly before aspirin, but had real problems. And here we're looking at the structure of acetanilide. Acetanilide was first developed in 1886 as a painkiller. Problem was, it was toxic. And so the structure of acetanilide got tweaked, and it got turned into phenacetin you can see that the functional groups have only changed a little bit on going from acetanilide to phenacetin, which was also a painkiller. Problem is, it was also still a little bit too toxic to use in humans. And so, ultimately, in 1953, paracetamol was developed, another very similar derivative. What I'd like you to do, if you're a chemist, is just name all the functional groups in each of those molecules and think about how they differ to one another. Funnily enough, that's still the way drug discovery is done today. You find a compound that's a little bit active, you tweak it, you tweak it, you improve it, until you've got your blockbuster drug that's going to make you a fortune. Like aspirin, paracetamol is believed to be a COX inhibitor, and this is partly the mode of action. The problem is paracetamol also has significant liver toxicity, and the toxic dose of paracetamol is actually quite low. And the reason is that paracetamol gets broken down into a compound in your body that then reacts with enzymes in the liver and damages them. Funnily enough, if paracetamol was developed today, it probably wouldn't be considered safe enough to get past the screening required to become a standard medication. However, it is fair to say it's completely safe to use at the standard prescribed dose. After the success of aspirin and paracetamol and making even more money for the drugs companies, the Brits wanted to get involved and Boots wanted to develop their own anti-pain medication. And the one they came up with eventually was ibuprofen. And you're looking at the structure of ibuprofen here, otherwise known as brufen. Funnily enough, it was first uh, developed and found to be an anti-pain uh, anti medication, and the guys who developed it tested it on hangovers. So you may be wondering why there's a wavy bond within the structure. Well, the reason is that that particular carbon is attached to four different functional groups. If you look at it, it's attached to a benzene ring, a carboxylic acid, a methyl group, a CH3, and one extra group, a hydrogen, which we don't show in the actual structure. And that means that it's a chiral centre. The methyl group could actually be pointing up towards us, or down away from us. There are two different forms of that molecule. They're mirror images and they're called enantiomers. 
If you're a chemist, I want you to try and draw the enantiomers and label them as the S and the R forms of the molecule. Interestingly, it's only the S form of this drug that's active, but the drug is used as a mixture of S and R forms. And in the answers section to this podcast, which will be linked at the end of this particular video, you'll be able to find out why ibuprofen is used as the racemic mixture. And like aspirin and paracetamol, ibuprofen is also a COX inhibitor. So all three of those drugs work on very similar pathways of pain associated with prostaglandin synthesis, with prostaglandins being one of the reasons that you feel pain. So if you stop the formation of prostaglandins, you stop the experience of pain. But what about if the pain gets really bad? What about if aspirin, paracetamol, ibuprofen, all these standard over-the-counter medications simply don't work? What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Well, at that point, you're probably going to have to go and get pain care medication from professionals, and you're probably going to end up with some kind of opiate drug. So again, the natural world is the source of these opiate drugs. Morphine is found in the resin inside the opium poppy. You're looking at a sample of an opium poppy here. You can see the resin coming out, and that's where morphine is obtained from. Looking at the chemical structure of morphine, you'll see it's quite a lot more complex than the simple compounds like paracetamol, ibuprofen, that we were just looking at previously. And what morphine does is it effectively behaves like an endorphin within your body, and that helps to kill pain within your body. It binds to a receptor called the mu opioid receptor, and that's something that endorphins would do, and that's associated with killing pain. If you're a chemist, one of the things I'd like you to do is to have a look at the structure of morphine here and think about how many chiral centres are present in molecule morphine. Perhaps the most active form of morphine and one of the most controversial is diamorphine. Diamorphine is otherwise known as heroin. Now, believe it or not, heroin was also developed in the late 1890s by Bayer, the same as aspirin. And it was developed to help in treatment of cough and pain associated with coughing. And here you can see an early sample of heroin that was released onto the market, something you could buy. And it was first marketed in 1898. Believe it or not, Bayer developed this drug as a non-addictive morphine substitute. How wrong they were. Heroin is actually the most addictive and harmful of all the drugs of abuse. You can see here a little graph uh, that shows how harmful and how addictive different drugs are. And you can see heroin is really off the chart compared to the other drugs. It's a really seriously bad drug. Heroin didn't become controlled until 1914. Up to that point, you could just wander into any pharmacy and buy heroin or diamorphine. And although being controlled quite strictly, it's been quite widely used in anti-pain medication. If you're, if you're medicated, particularly in the UK on the National Health Service with diamorphine, you're being given heroin at a low dose as a way of controlling pain. And here we're looking at the structure of diamorphine. And what you can see is it's just like morphine, only those two OH groups have been converted into two esters. And one of the things I want you to think about is how is diamorphine converted in the body into morphine? And why might diamorphine be more active than morphine? The one thing that's absolutely clear is that without painkillers, um, the world will be a lot more difficult place. We've only actually had chemical painkillers for the last 120 years. It was chemists who developed them and meant that when you get a bit of a toothache like I had this morning, or a headache, or a hangover, you can simply go and take one of these tablets and sort it out. And if you have surgery or deep trauma, you can take one of the opiate-based drugs and your pain will be significantly eased. And easing people's pain is perhaps one of the most incredible and amazing applications of some simple organic chemistry.